financial leadership is changing. CFOs no longer record history. They make history. This podcast will help you become a better leader, strategic thinker, and digital visionary. Welcome to Secrets of Rockstar CFOs, the ultimate podcast for chief financial officers. Follow along as Jack McCullough engages in exciting chat with accomplished CFOs, learning how they overcame obstacles and positioned their companies for the future. Here's your host, Jack McCullough. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Secrets of Rockstar CFOs. I'm your host, Jack McCullough. By day, I'm the president and founder of the CFO Leadership Council. Today, we have a fantastic guest, so let's rock. Today's guest is a true visionary on global financial transformation, Carolina Dybeck Hapa. She is with General Electric, and Carolina, welcome to the Secrets of Rockstar CFOs. Jack, thank you. Thanks for having me. Oh, I've been, been looking forward to it for a while. And before we get into the, the CFO stuff, I want to chat a little about your early background, um, because you're our first guest who grew up in Sweden. And I'd love to know a little bit about growing up in Sweden and how that led to being, you made you the CFO of an American iconic company. Well, Jack, if you grow up in Sweden, what you realize pretty early on is that Sweden is a small country and not many people speak Swedish. Um, so if you want to grow, uh, you quickly land abroad. And if you land abroad, uh, you do need to speak other languages. So I would say for me, from sort of early adulthood, I've um, always had a very global experience and, and appreciation for, for different countries and, and cultures. And I think that's what led me to, uh, to get my first CFO role in Germany uh, in my late twenties. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. So you speak how many languages? Four: Four. Swedish, Polish, German, and uh, English. It, you just stumble on English there. Yeah, that's it's my fourth that's... language. So bear with me. <laughs> it, well, it's funny because it's you know it's accented, but it's flawless. Well, four is not that impressive. It's only three more than I speak. So. Uh, so good for you for speaking for. Anyway, so your, your first job was in Germany, though. That's interesting. I would say, so my, my first CFO role uh, was in Germany, uh, and I was uh, 29 when I got that role. And I would say what's interesting is that I actually got the, the spec for that role once I already was in the role. And the spec said, what we need for this is a German, someone with 15 years of experience, and a profound understanding of the industry. I was Swedish, I was 29, uh, and I came from the tech industry. So, so clearly they must have changed uh, their mind sort of through that process, but they did believe in me and they gave me the change and the chance here to, to do this. And um, it was a fantastic period in my life. Uh, I learned enormously. I learned what it really meant to be in a manufacturing environment. It was my first industrial job, right? And um, I saw sort of manufacturing, I saw R&D, I saw commercial, I saw what worked and what didn't work. Uh, and I also got my first experience in how to build and to lead uh, a team. Kudos to the management team for being a little bit more open-minded and recognizing you know, the talent you bring rather than that you check a series of lists. But that is impressive that you went 0 for 3 on the big three and and yet still en ended up with the position. And I can't imagine that there are many 29-year-old CFOs in Germany. Is that fair to say that you had a very high level of responsibility at a young age? I would say that that is uh, true. And the reality was that there was a lot of transformation needed because this was a group of companies that had been bought by ASA and there was a need to integrate and transform the companies going forward. So um, I think that's really what, what made them pick me. Yeah, that, no, that, that's fantastic. And you're certainly, you know, and aside from just speaking four languages and um, you're one of the most global CFOs in the world. Um, how many countries have you lived and worked in? Oh, time time flies. I have worked and lived in uh, seven countries, um, and I I mean there were also different industries that I worked worked across. And you know time time flies. I I thought about that over the weekend that 
I've been a large cap CFO for 13 years, but as CFOs, we usually count that in earnings. So it's about 50 earnings, three different companies, seven geographies, and the different industries. The earnings. Well, that's a that's a great way to put it. So, and uh, what, what countries have you worked in over the years? Uh, so I started in in Sweden. Uh, I have to think here, and then I was actually in the U.S., uh, Switzerland, Russia, Germany. UK and then back to the US. Wow, because yeah, I um I believe I stumbled across the fact when the first time you were in the US, you were in Santa Barbara. And yes, and, and you went from Santa Barbara to Russia. Uh yeah. You, you do know it, you're supposed to kind of go the other direction, right? You go from the cold weather cities to the warm weather ones, but you went from paradise almost to, to a relatively cold part of the world. So it must have been a wonderful opportunity for you. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's more about, for me, it's always been sort of being driven about what, what's my mission? How do I fit into um, a company and what is really the transformation needed and being part of uh, driving that transformation? And I think with, if you think about it sort of from a company perspective, I started uh, in different roles and grew through ASA and then via Maersk and then I came to GE. And it was sort of a I would say as I, I grew through that, it was really about scaling up uh, and getting into more complex and global environments. And that really built the tools uh, that I now have in place. Um, and then sort of when GE came up, it was all about uh, sort of doing the same thing, but but faster and on a larger scale. Uh, but it was also about value creation. And, and um, I'm really proud of what we created in my previous roles when it comes from value. You look at sort of Asa Abloy and where we were, sort of this traditional industrial company um, and me going from tech to industrials, you talked about, you know, from, from Russia to the US or doing it the opposite way. It was the same with my career. I started in tech and then I went to industrials. Most people did the opposite. They started in industrials and moved to tech. Um, but for me, it was really about seeing the opportunities and, and where the value creation would be. And for example, with us, I saw this opportunity of this traditional industrial company and how you can really move that uh, to a sort of tech enabled giant uh, and with a lot of value creation along along the way. That That's fascinating. So it's amazing how you've had all these roles and they each one you took something, learned something, and that sort of each one of them in the aggregate prepared you for the role at, at GE, which is, you know, I, I believe by far the biggest company you've worked at. Is that fair to say? That is fair. Yeah. So, and, you know, so I, I want to chat about GE because you're, um, it's interesting, I believe, and do correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you're the first outsider who is hired to be a CFO of GE. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. And are you also the first non-American to have been in the uh, the global CFO seat as well? I believe so. So, so I'm curious, and, you know, I, I consider GE, you know, truly iconic when I think of the GE logo. You know, it's as well recognized, you know, it's what Disney, maybe Apple computer and one or two more. But it, it's certainly, you know, to me, you know, particularly growing up in the Boston area, one of the most iconic companies in the world. So what was that like for you to come in as the, the first outsider, so to speak, in the CFO world and, and also not being an American? Was that created some great challenges and opportunities, I suppose, right? Well, I, I would say my... With my background, having lived and worked in different companies and countries, um, I think for me that part was was uh, worked really well. Um, I think if you look at what the situation we were in with GE, clearly uh, there was a big transformation needed and a big turnaround needed. And um, I know that Larry and the board, when they were looking at, at sort of who can be that change agent, um, and then wanting to combine that with the CFO that was both strategic and operational. And why I say this is that many CFOs are, are either are typically either strategic or operational. Um, and I think with my background that I, that I have both was, was important for them. I also believe that my strong background in decentralization and lean, uh, sort of for me, critical guiding principles for transformation was also something that the company was um, very much uh, 
looking forward. And then I would say the strong capital allocation, um, sort of coming with a strong capital allocation track record was also important considering uh, the situation with the portfolio and, and assessing uh, what to do where. And uh, if you take all of that together, sort of the strategic and operational, the decentralization and lean, the strong capital allocation, um, Larry and I have a very uh, common background in this area. So I do believe that that was critical uh, for the job, but also for our partnership in this massive transformation. Yeah, it's interesting because I was actually going to ask you about your relationship with Larry. And there was a study by Accenture a few years ago, and it determined the most important relationship at the C-suite level was that between the CFO and the CEO. And so I'm curious, uh, you know, what is that relationship? You know, you're going through together leading, you know, what perhaps is the greatest business transformation in corporate history. So I'd, lo I'd love to know a little about that dynamic between the two of you, if I may. Yeah, sure. And I, I think it, um, it it's different for different uh, people. But for me uh, and for Larry, I would say the CEO and the CFO are true partners. And together you're being strong. You build strong teams uh, and alliances. And um, I think for me and Larry, having that same background, um, was was really important and really helpful considering the size and and the speed needed to drive the, the GE transformation. And if you think about it, you take one example. I, I talked about this with the decentralization. So we both had to pretty fast figure out what are the centers of gravity within GE. And what I mean by that is what are the business units and what does that mean from a PL perspective? So sort of how do you decide from this enormous company that had five segments and five PLs, how do you set the businesses up for success? How do you decide what are uh, the right levels of of PLs? And um, well, we we traveled around together quite a lot uh, in the beginning to to figure out what the right setup would be, and we decided it was going from those five PLs to 30 PLs or business units, I call them PLs <laughs> as a CFO, because <laughs> having a full PL in cash is so, so important uh, when you're managing a business. Um, so that was a big uh, sort of a big decision for us. Interesting. So you were brought in, I mean, you're definitely not a conventional CFO. You know, everything about you is all about business transformation, financial transformation. You're a bit of a, a groundbreaker, I think, and it's fair to say that. So how has that served you at, at GE, which is going through, you know, the only thing I can even come at that's kind of close is back when AT&T was broken up in the 90s, I guess. And, you know, relatively, it's probably comparable. But how has all that served you in sort of assessing things and, and you know, making the decision to, to do, you know, the biggest transformation ever? Well, I would say the my, my background and having done operational CFO roles uh, in a sort of smaller but highly complex scale and having many years of expertise uh, within roles that have grown and in a sort of both operational and strategic way, I think that has helped me uh, enormously. And, and you know, we talk about capital allocation because over time that is sort of truly how, how you win. We make the right bets there. Um, having done over... I think it's almost 200 acquisitions in my previous roles at ASA uh, and successful integration of those over time. That has also helped me enormously in, in uh, understanding what works and what doesn't work. Um, and I do think this about being a, a change agent and, and sort of staying agile, being able to adapt to any situation if it's a country um, or if it's an industry, but also if it's a different team, um, that is a skill set that served me really well. And you really have to partner with everyone from sort of the, the people uh, on the manufacturing floor to, to the board um, and together sort of drive uh, value creation. And wh where does it really come from? Well, from the way I look at it is sort of you have a company and really what drives the company is innovation and successful innovation. And you look at that innovation, that is what's going to give you growth. And you add to that uh, operational discipline on the cost side, but that innovation driving growth and creating and generating enormous value for a company gives you the opportunity to invest money in the future and you sort of have a flywheel of value creation um and, and that's yeah. been that's been key um, it's for me it's remarkable because the cfo really the, in the modern world is a value creator it is um you know the 
the sort of the division of the CFO being behind the scenes reporting what happened after it happened, you know, that's a bygone era at this point. It's a value, you know, it's definitely a value creation type of role. And you seem to exemplify that in, in a lot of ways. So, but I, I want to just make sure I heard something correctly. Did you say you did 200 acquisitions at one company? <laughs> yes, I would but, say it was over 16 years, <laughs> but okay, that's but, still a lot. <laughs> yeah, I mean, 16 years is what, 192 months. So you were basically doing an acquisition a month for 16 years. Is that about yeah. right, more or less? Yeah, yes, it is. And I did it that you have to think about it as in different in different sort of perspective. Once in the company, sort of negotiating yourself with the, the potential uh, acquisitions, then from a segment point of view, sort of running the teams that run the acquisition, and then from a corporate perspective, uh, the governance and basically the, the approvals uh, on different toll gates uh, before you, you agree to an acquisition. But it does give you a lot of experience in, in how important it is to really start with a strategic fit, decide are you the best owner? So what are the operational sort of improvements you can make? What are your synergies? Then finding, a, I would say, deal math that works um, so that it's a win-win. And then just as importantly is how do you integrate the company into your existing company? Because that's where the value creation really happens. Um, and, and you sort of, you learn to be very disciplined and you put up a capital uh, allocation framework uh, that you stick to, uh, which is so, so important over time. And we did. I, yes, a friend of mine who's done a lot of acquisitions, he said, okay, now we've done, we've acquired the company, now the real work starts. And, you know, the point being that the integration is sometimes more, actually more difficult than the deal itself. So, but, uh, but that's crazy. So I, I want to come back to you, this, your start at uh, GE and it, you had the interesting experience. You started GE right at the beginning of COVID, right? So, yeah. Yeah. So welcome to the United States. Now stay in. Um, but uh, that was challenging timing. And just in terms of like, you know, learning about the business and forming the alliances that it's critical for any C-suite member to form, all of a sudden that's a lot more difficult. How did you manage that situation? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll tell you, Jack. So my first hundred days, um, that was a lot on, on Microsoft Teams, but it was a lot about understanding and getting to know the business. Uh, but I'll tell you, after a hundred days, um, I, I talked to my husband and my children and, and said, okay, we're going to move. Even with COVID, everybody's going to move. Um, and we did. So all of us, we moved across the ocean. <laughs> um, During COVID. In some yeah, summer 2020. Um, but that was the only way to really get close to where the action was and get closer to the people. Because I do strongly believe that empowering teams as well as keeping them accountable is uh, how you're most successful. Um, and I think this this was so important for me. So getting close to the people and being able to build that one-on-one -on -one relationship was, was so, so important. Because that's also how you create an alliance, but you also create people that you can leverage and can then drive the message uh, into the business and then really have that high high impact. And for, for me, having sort of the right people in the right place and making sure that they were empowered with the right tools so they could take those decisions and have the right impact was, was so, so important. And that's why it was also important um, for me to have the businesses be supported by finance out in the businesses. So it was pretty big transformation for GE to move sort of from a more centralized finance team to have finance much more embedded in the businesses with the operating teams so that they could problem solve together. And what I talked about in the beginning, how it went from five to 30 PLs, that also meant that we needed to recruit well, 30 uh, CEOs, but well, 25 CEOs, but also 25 CFOs for the businesses. And some were, of course, internally promoted, but it was putting those team in, teams in place uh, to be able to drive performance where it matters, so close to the customer, close to the innovation. Uh, but that also made people's jobs more fun. And I said to them, um, similar to what you said in the beginning, you know, it's going to be about making the news, not about reporting the news uh, in finance. That's funny. You know, it's funny. I often use the quote, uh, CFOs no longer report history, they make history. So now mm -hmm. I feel like you validated that my my quote is actually a legitimate thing to say that coming from no one less than you that that's fantastic. But, uh, but you, you know, you're right, you mentioned being finances embedded in the business. 
and there sort of has been the transformation that you know finance was you know maybe a necessary evil or maybe they you know were there to you know to stop things from happening but with that sort of mindset embed them in the overall business then they become a strategic asset i imagine right yeah, very much so. And, and you are there to support where, where the action is and, and you can really help drive the performance. So I think what was important for those then 30 teams uh, with the CEOs and the CFOs was that they would have those right tools so they can really drive the impact. And they can also measure and see if the actions they are taking are creating the impact they wanted. Uh, and if not, they can pivot. Um, so, so it's just a much more sort of leaner, closer to the customer action-oriented uh, solution, which also is so, so important because, you know, if there's competition out there. So you you have to take the right decisions with speed. Um, that's really how you win. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It, 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 the right decision slowly is not the right decision, which is what it boils down to. So cool. But I, I want to chat with you a little bit about it's, uh, GE, of course, is going through the transformation and it's being divided into three parts. Can you give like a little overview of each of the three parts of the new GE? Or the th three new companies? Yes, of course. Yes. So um, what we're going to have is GE Healthcare, GE Aerospace, and GE Vernova. So we'll have three independent investment-grade public companies, uh, that all three leaders in their different industries. Um, and if you just look at the, the size uh, and the scale of the businesses, I think it's, it's stunning. If you look at healthcare, 2 billion procedures per year are done with GE technology. 2 billion look at GE per year. Wow. So. Yeah, yeah. And if you look at GE Aerospace, yeah, three out of four commercial flights globally have GE engines. And then GE Vernova, which is uh, the name of our um, energy businesses. We talk about the energy transition. A third of electricity that is generated in the world is generated with with uh, GE technology. So enormous impact in enormously important industries yesterday, today, and and tomorrow. Um, so incredibly exciting times for, for all the businesses. Oh yeah, it's gonna, it, it's, it's it, GE itself is so big that it's cut into three ways. And each of the three companies is still gigantic and individually significant on the global economy. So, and again, getting back to, you know, GE, one of those companies, you know, we all grew up with, right? I mean, everybody in the world is a customer of GE, it seems like, right? Even if it's just the light bulbs or whatever. But what makes this point in history the time to divide into three different companies? Well, Jack, I, I think you almost have to take a, a step back to sort of set set the stage uh, of where we were, because that brings us to uh, the rationale of uh, splitting into three companies. Um, and, and I would say, when I joined, the, the end game wasn't clear, but what I did know was, was what my mission was. So my mission was fix the balance sheet, fix the financial performance and operating performance, and find a solution for maximizing value. Um, so sort of when I joined the, the, the opening balance or my opening balance with the balance sheet was we had $140 billion of debt uh, with near term maturities. We also needed about 20 billion in cash to run the businesses, which were much more than what we were generating. Oh, and by the way, speaking of cash generation, I talked about how I joined and COVID hit. Well, COVID really eliminated the demand for our best business, which was aerospace services, because that's based on how much you fly. Uh, and just to give you perspective, that, that was more than 100% uh, of the company's free cash flow that was generated there. So... With that as the a backdrop, the question was, what do we do? You had the immediate, con immediate concerns, you had the midterm challenges, and you had the longer term goals. So we had to start with immediate concerns, start working on the midterm challenges, and also keeping in mind the long term goals. Uh, and they had to develop as we improved on the financial performance, as we improved on the balance sheet, and then how we really uh, could find what would be the maximum value for, for the businesses. Um, and I would say the it really started with sort of what were the customers' needs, other stakeholders like shareholders, employees, even suppliers, and figuring out what would be the optimal um, solution. And as we 
improved the balance sheet. We took out more than a hundred billion dollars of debt. We improved the financial performance. We more than doubled earnings and and um, generated much more free cash. That gave us the opportunity to land in three separate global leaders, investment grade and public companies with healthcare, energy, and aerospace. Um, and it's it's as you said, it's got, it's already created significant shareholder value. And of course, we have potential to do much more. Yeah, absolutely. It seems like the world has definitely embraced this change that you're leading. Fair to say? Yes, which is truly, truly exciting to see as well. Indeed. And there's more to come. Oh, cool. Well, we, we look forward to that. So, but in your current role, you're focusing largely, I would assume, perhaps even exclusively on you know, preparing these three companies to be solid, standalone, publicly traded type of companies. So um, do you find it, is, is that your exclusive role or are you doing some traditional financial leadership roles above and beyond that? And and how do you balance all of that? So, so I'm focused on um, the transformation and the separation into three companies. The first one, the healthcare, we already did early this year. And then we have the second one, which is gonna separate energy from, from aerospace early next year, practically meaning April then. And if you look at, at where we are, I would say like this, our biggest challenges are clearly behind us. I talked about fixing the balance sheet, improving the financial performance, as well as setting up the strategic direction for the company as we separate into three uh, businesses. So with that, there still is a lot of work technically to separate the businesses uh, going forward. And we set up like a huge um, PMO at, really at the beginning of this process with, with two of my teams uh, leading it. Uh, and probably 80% of the work that needs to be done um, for the spins is done by corporate finance um, and IT. So I'm working with the teams to deliver uh, on that. And, and if you take that in perspective, we're talking about thousands of legal entities across the globe. We have about 130,000 people moving entities. And we're also separating all the assets and liabilities in detail to the different balance sheets. Oh, and by the way, we also have more than 200 ERPs that we're separating. Wow. Uh, not to mention the other applications. So still a lot of work on the technical separation done. It's crazy. It's funny that the former accountant in me, I guess you never outgrow it, but when you're talking about that, I'm thinking of what, what are the accounting and legal fees involved in that to, to do this kind of thing. So, but cool. But it's interesting because I don't believe that there's any precedent for a deal like this. So it's not like you can follow, you can read a blueprint or follow a path forged by others. I think I mixed my metaphors there, but uh, hopefully made the point. But so what's the experience been like? It's not like you can call somebody and say, what did you do when you were faced that, with this? Nobody's done this, right? So what's that been like learning as you go and, you know, sort of creating a history? And do you think I, other companies I, I would, um, Yeah, I would say the I think the experience for me, having had the experience of sort of scaling with complexity and global, and also having done a spin uh, with E.ON in Germany when I was on the board, this is at an even bigger scale. But once you have done it, you sort of know what the drivers are. You just do it at the larger scale. Um, and we also have a really strong team that is delivering on this in corporate finance. And I think that's another really important part. Like you talked about fees to, to others, but for us, a lot of this has been done in-house with the corporate finance team. Uh, and with his history and all the transactions, we have a highly skilled team that is that is focused on this. And why I say that is because it's also important that not the whole company focuses on the spin, because then you can come in what, what some people call spin limbo. So for us, it's been really important to separate and say 95% of the company is focused on BAU, so business as usual, serving the customers, delivering innovation and doing it in an effective way. So a 5% really uh, is focused on, on uh, the spins. But out of those 5%, the biggest part of that is corporate finance and, and corporate DT. Um, and it's been key to keep it like that so that you have the right people focusing on the right tasks so that you can continue to deliver uh, in the businesses while at the same time executing on probably the largest transformation in corporate America. Yeah, it's, it's um, by the way, BAU, somehow I live to be 
uh, as old as I am, and I I had never heard that phrase before. So I'm going to be lifting that from you. So thank you for that. So, but you know, I I think the company is well prepared because historically, you know, GE has been known for many many things. One of which is GE Finance, right? I mean, you'd put GE Finance as good as and better than any company in the world. When when you look at other companies, sort of the GE CFOs. GE finance alums or CFOs at so many other companies. I'd put the GE alumni database against, you know, any grad school, Wharton, Harvard, Chicago, Stanford, MIT, Sloan. I mean, you have at your fingertips some of the best financial professionals on the planet. So I'm sure that helped. Absolutely. And that's why we could do a lot of this uh, in-house as well, in delivering what I remember, uh, I still remember in GE Healthcare said to me, and he meant this with love. He said, you know, this is a bit like brain surgery for finance. So <laughs> I like that expression. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, I, I, that's probably actually a pretty good analogy. So one of the things you shared with me, Carolina, is when you talk to people and you share the fact that you, you work at GE, and they don't necessarily know that you're the CFO of GE, they only know you work there. But it's even people who don't work for the company, they're thrilled to see the success that you're experiencing and and a, a lot of your colleagues just feel really terrific that GE's back on top of the world so to speak what that what must that be like for you on you know a personal level I would say that's been one of the best parts for me um so when I joined GE uh, and met people we were in a very different situation but already then I can tell you that everybody um uh, was rooting for us and everybody also had a personal story about GE. When I said I worked for GE, they would then say, oh, well, so did my dad or, or my sister, or I grew up next to a GE factory, or I used the products. So everybody has a relationship to GE, and it's been clear that everybody wants us to win. And they were rooting for us already then. Uh, and now when I meet people, and we're in a very different situation, and we are winning, uh, people are so happy for us. And of course, people internally uh, are thrilled to be in this, this situation because who doesn't want to be part of a winning team? And now they are again. Yeah, it's such an important company. And like those people you've met, you know, I had an uncle that worked, you know, I, I think he graduated high school at 17 or 18 and retired at 65. I don't think he worked anywhere but GE during his entire career. I mean, it, it, and there are so many stories like that, right, of careers and you know, just, just lives affected by the company. So I'm sure there's a great sense of pride that it is, you know, back to its former glorious position. But so, but I do want to get back to your own uh, background because by reputation, you're somewhat of a digital visionary and it's not the coding, but you have sort of figured out how to use technology as a competitive advantage. So how do you see technology impacting financial leadership in the years ahead? And Gen AI is probably the big thing. We can talk about that or just other th other trends that you're seeing as well. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think sort of starting out in the tech uh, world in my earlier uh, years was sort of very formative and, and made me uh, a digital believer for life. And I, I continue to, to believe that. And if you look at ASA, how we move the company from sort of a traditional industrial company with mechanical solutions to electromechanical solutions to digital and SaaS solutions, that was an enormous uh, transformation of a company, a different type of transformation, but still a transformation. And for me, being responsible then for, for IT and driving the digital part of that was uh, incredibly fun and, and rewarding. And uh, so I've stayed, I've stayed a believer. Um, and you asked about AI and what, and what that can do. I, I think what I see with my background in sort of driving lean and digitization I almost compare it to sort of the what the industrial revolution did for the manufacturing jobs. So we all sort of know from history, if we look at uh, what happened, how the work we did on the manufacturing floor, how that was impacted um, through technology and how it massively improved safety, quality, delivery and cost um, and made the jobs more fun. And, and I believe yeah. the same thing will be true with AI for, for office workers. We will improve the quality, the delivery, and the cost. Um, and, and what I see is that how we do things change dramatically, but it also means that uh, 
the jobs we will have will be much more more fun uh, and much more about sort of writing um, versus reporting. Interesting. So, uh, so we're experiencing the equivalent of the industri industrial revolution for office workers. So, I'm going to steal that from you as well. Boy, I'm just such a thief. Uh, cool. <laughs> but I, I wanted to chat with you, and in, in particularly because more than almost anyone, you you have a, a true global vision and an understanding of the global world and how it affects business. So, I, I think we're getting used to maybe living in chaotic times you know, CFOs and other executives, but never more so in 2023. So do you have any advice for other financial leaders or just business people in general of how you can prepare for, for living and working in a global economy that seems to always be chaotic? It just, it doesn't seem like it'll ever, you know, be 20 years of normalcy like we had for a while. Yeah, well, well, you're right. There is, it really isn't a short of a of global issues or issues that impact our businesses. And it can be hard to focus on the day-to-day -day, um, and making progress on the long term. Uh, but I would say, if you look at it, we, we had all of that internally. So we had to face it all. And we did the short term and the long term in, in parallel. And I, I do think it's about making sure that you focus on what's critical and that you decide or make sure you know what you have to deliver and that you follow up on that and make sure that you pivot uh, as you go, because that is what happens when you have a lot of change. You sort of have a plan, you work with that, but then you also pivot um, as things as things develop. And this is about staying agile and open to change and working in an environment like that. I do think that that is, um, that is critical. But I also think that it's even more important now um, that you feel that your company has a purpose and that you feel that you know, makes you proud and makes you um, happy about working there and also makes you want to go that extra mile. Um, and I feel that we, where we are at GE, what I talked to you about, you know, with the healthcare and the flight and the energy transition, it certainly is there. And it, it also makes me feel sort of connected to uh, the global economy in a almost unique way. Yeah, it's interesting. I think one thing COVID that shifted people that, you know, where we work isn't just where we work people, you know, obviously the paycheck's a paramount thing, but people want to feel connected like somehow they're working for a company that's making a positive impact on the overall globe. It's a, it's a very positive change. So, and you're, you're fortunate to work in an organization like that. So, cool. yeah. so I have one final question and hard hitting journalism. I hate to go here, uh, but you may know, I have 30,000 LinkedIn connections, including you, you have by far the best LinkedIn photo of any of my 30,000 connections. Uh, it's you're wearing uh, a fighter pilot outfit. Uh, I'd love to know if there was a story behind that. Yeah, it's certainly what well, there certainly is a story be, behind that. So, and it actually starts around the corner here in Boston, because I was up in uh, Lynn, uh, our factory where we have the uh, aerospace defense team, and we were there for an operating review and we were going through the business and we were also going through the manufacturing uh, and as I was passing the different cells I saw one of the cells with the Swedish flag on it and the team told me then that this is where we are manufacturing the engines for uh, Jos Gripen so the Swedish uh, fighter jet and um, when I heard that after that I talked to Tony our uh, team leader there and uh, then I connected with with uh, the team at Saab and make one thing led to another. And when I was in Sweden over the um, holidays uh, later that year, I actually got to go to Lean Shopping and have a full day experience, including flying uh, a Saab grid and, and it was it was amazing. I'll tell you that. You're at 30,000 feet, you have two forces of up to seven and you're flying at supersonic speed. So uh, it was truly amazing. And I, I even got to steer through through a loop. <laughs> so oh, really? I, that was a, yeah, it was a fantastic experience. But but really the whole experience from the morning, everything sort of from, you know, the fitting, uh, the trial, also running uh, different tests. It was, um, it was so, so good to see the team and the passion of the team 
Uh, but then, of course, also taking taking the flight. <laughs> yeah, I think I would have passed on the flight. I would have chickened out. So I, I, I give you uh, congratulations for that. But that is so cool. And it wouldn't have happened had you not noticed the Swedish flag, right? It sounds like no. Nope. So, yes. yeah, wow, that, that that's fantastic. So have your eyes and ears out. Anyway, Carolina, this has been a fantastic conversation. I'm sure our listeners learned a lot from you. So I, I want to thank you uh, for, for being a guest on The Secrets of Rockstar CFOs. And if you have any final words, I would love to hear them. Well, Jack, thanks so much for, for having me. I uh, just wanted to say that it's been a, a, a true blessing to be part of the GE transformation in such an iconic company. Um, and I'm so happy that we have come as far as we have. And, and I'm sure that this is just the beginning of the three companies uh, for the next 130 years. Um, so thank you for having me. Or to, we'll get together at the 130th year. So I'll be almost 200 then, but that's cool. Thanks, Carolina. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode. To continue your exploration of this role that focuses on strategy, leadership, finance, and technology, listen to more episodes of the show at rockstarcfos.com. Join this revolution, episode by episode. Push yourself to achieve great things and unlock the best opportunities available to you. CFOs are creating a legacy, and it's time for you to leave your own unique imprint on the world today. That's all for now. See you on the next one.